Well, I want to encourage you today to turn to the classic, the classic um, Christmas passage of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We're going to take the opportunity to read this passage, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. So I want to say a special welcome to all of our guests that are here to see uh, Joy get baptized today. So you guys are so welcome and so glad you're here to enjoy that with us. Uh, I can't help but make all these puns on Joy uh, since that we're, we're doing that. All right, would you stand with me and let's read cha- uh, chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 20. If you'll just follow along as I read. Um, We'll read this well-known Christmas passage. Chapter 2 in Luke, verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to take to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into the heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen, which were just as they had been told. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Uh, I want to encourage you, uh, some of you are aware, uh, we had a little bit of an audible yesterday. I'm not saying this to excuse myself or anything as I get started. Uh, Our pastor, Will, was slated to speak for us today, and he is ill. Will is ill. Well, I'm full of those today. Uh, But... Uh, he's not doing well, and he's, uh, he says a couple sentences and then hacks for another couple sentences, and then, uh, so he's just, he didn't feel like he could get through anything here this morning, so uh, we don't usually do this to each other's pastors. We don't usually give each other a call on Saturday afternoon and say, can you fill in with me for me on Sunday, but sometimes just life happens that way. And so I'm, I'm the, uh, I was happily on the bench enjoying my weekend, and then I got called into the game. So that's just where we are today. Uh, but I want to I take you to a favorite passage of mine, and I know I've shared this with you uh, uh, many different times. Uh, I grew up in a church that it was the tradition for all of the children in the Sunday school to memorize uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Uh, And one of the things that we dutifully did is uh, at our Christmas program, we would all get up together and recite uh, Luke chapter 2. Even still today, I have remnants of that in my mind, and of course, it's embedded in the King James Version translation, uh, since that's what we used uh, in uh, the time that I was growing up. But I want to I want to take you to uh, uh, this declaration today, and and again our topic today is peace. And I want to take you to the declaration of the angels uh, in the Gospel of Luke. 
Uh, I often joke about the Gospel of Luke. Uh, if you look at the different uh, accounts of the story of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, one of the things I always joke about with the Gospel of Luke, it's Jesus the musical, right? Uh, and so when I was a, a young man in particular, I hated musicals. Uh, I always thought that they were very annoying. My mom would try to get me to watch them. And I always felt that just about the time things were getting interested, somebody would start singing. And that was super annoying, right? I wanted somebody to punch somebody or fight or right, do something like that. And instead, they started singing and dancing. And I thought that was always so irritating, right, when I was younger. Well, when you're reading the Gospel of Luke, uh, that's exactly what happens in the birth stories that begin in Luke chapter 1 and 2. And of course, we're, we're entering the story a chapter in, and so that we know that Mary, who's great with child at this point in time, uh, she's very near birth, and matter of fact, she's going to have the child, as we know, when she gets to Bethlehem. Uh, we know that Mary's a very young girl. She might be uh, 15, 16 years old. And uh, Mary has been favored by God, and God came to her through an angel and told her that there was going to be something dramatic that was going to change her life at that moment and forever. And so the, through the Spirit of God, there was going to be a conception of a child that was not going to involve a man, and that she was going to give birth to this child, and this child was the promised Messiah, the figure that all of the Old Testament looked forward to. This Messiah is the, is the term that in Greek is referred to as the Christ, the Christos. The Messiah is this anointed one, the one who's anointed by God with the Spirit of God, and he's going to be a Davidic king who's going to come and fulfill God's promises. And so Mary's told that that's going to happen through her. And so the backstory is, is this little girl that's going with her husband now to Bethlehem uh, at a very inopportune moment uh, to go to Bethlehem is that Mary. And so in Luke, one of the ways he punctuates uh, the opening stories is after you have a little bit, of, you have one of the characters that are introduced and you have a little movement forward in the story, somebody breaks out in song. So uh, Mary breaks out in song in chapter one, Zacharias breaks out in song, Simeon breaks out in song, and here we have the song of the angels, and the angels are singing, and they're declaring, right, and I always joked about this when I was a kid, because we used to sing that song, Gloria, right, uh, I, I, and it's the longest uh, word in history, I think. Uh, it's the word that goes on forever. And I always wondered about it. And of course, it was one of those songs as a kid I didn't really understand because it's a Latin phrase, Gloria in excelsis. And when I was young, I didn't speak in Latin very often. Uh, and I remember the first person that tried to explain that to me, what it was really saying, uh, right? So it's a translation of the Greek word doxa into Latin gloria. Uh, and so glory to God, praise to God in the highest, the highest praise should go to God, right? And I, and I thought about this, why the author of the song uh, would make that word the, f the focus of the whole song, right? You can't get off that song and you sing you, that word and you sing it like 30 times, right? Uh, so the idea is that I just think he's trying to get at the idea that he's getting inside the angels that they're looking at the God of the universe has condescended to become a man. And God's mercy and his faithfulness and his compassion and his justice are demonstrated in what's going on. And it's a marvel that's worthy of the highest praise. And so it's just this long word, right, of doing that. And I think one of the, one of the uh, 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 dynamics of the Christian life is that the Holy Spirit takes us over the course of our life deeper and deeper into the truth of the wonder of Christmas and of the cross and of the empty tomb so that there are things that are so rich and so full that they compel obedience and trust right through even the darkest moments. And so the angels right, are just looking at this event and they're singing and the songwriter wanted to bring us into that joy and wanted us to focus on the fact that this moment is worthy of the highest praise. Right, and as we've talked about here, peace and just as Tracy prayed, um, everything about the Christmas season is going to try to take your focus off of that event. 
right, of wonder and joy at what Christmas signifies, that the God of the universe stepped into the world not because we were calling for him, right? I was thinking the other day of the uh, old hymn, right? I'll get it out. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, right? Then Jesus rescued me. Right? I wasn't calling out for Jesus. I wasn't saying my felt needs weren't for him. No, I was busy running in the opposite direction. So this baby that's coming into the world, this God of the universe who's taking on human form, humiliating himself by becoming human, is doing it right with the heart of the Father to accomplish the will of the Father to redeem and restore rebels. Right? And the rebels are going to reject him by and large, but nonetheless, he's going to pour out his life for them to the uttermost, the death on a cross, and come from the grave to signify his power and offer the new life he has to all those who hate him. And that's the wonder of this moment, and it's worthy of the highest praise. But you know, this story is set in the, in the context of a book that's written to a single individual. This is one of the interesting things about the book of Luke. Uh, it's the only gospel that actually tells us who the recipient of the gospel is. And matter of fact, the book of Luke and the book of Acts are both written to this one man, and his name is Theophilus. We get him in Luke chapter 1 right at the very beginning. And Luke says, I've written these things to you, Theophilus, so that you might have a greater certainty about the things that you've been taught. Now, Theophilus as getting these books, and he's on the other end of all the events in the book of Acts, Theophilus is a Gentile. Theophilus is not a Jew. Theophilus is a Greek name for a Gentile. And so Luke, as a Gentile, is writing to another Gentile to encourage him to believe that what has happened to him as a follower of Jesus is what is God's plan all along, that God has intervened in Jesus Christ to bring salvation to the world. And so Luke traces the beginning of the intervention from Luke, right in the birth narratives, through the life of Jesus until his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. And then it picks up the ascension in Acts chapter 1 and takes us out to the rest of the story of the church going to the ends of the earth with the gospel so that Theophilus knows that it's been God's plan all along to bring about salvation, deep change and reformation and restoration through Jesus, and that it's his intention that that be declared to the world. So we want to sit along Theophilus this morning. I want to learn, uh, I want us to pick up a couple lessons from this little story about some things that we need to learn about the God of peace from that. Now, I put together some notes. If you have those, I want to encourage you to take a look at those and write down some things as we work our way through. Uh, you won't want to write everything that I say, obviously, but I'm confident that God has something for you today that he'll want you to pick up. And so I want to see a couple things here before we draw together some threads and reflect here at the end. I want to see two things, and you'll see this here on your notes that uh, I want to draw out is one, you'll see in Roman numeral two, the God of peace is at work in the big picture, and then number two, the God of peace is at work in the details, right? Um, Tracy mentioned this in her notes here about the chaos that many of us uh, are facing, uh, and we are uh, on a national level facing some real chaos. On an international level, we are facing some real chaos. And for some of us, the chaos is penetrating right into our homes and our relationships and circumstances uh, and things along those lines. Sometimes it's very dark. Sometimes there are things in and of themselves that aren't, but it still makes life complicated. My wife and I, uh, right, have nothing to compare to the poor people in Ukraine today. Uh, we have nothing to compare to that, but we're in the midst of selling a home and moving to another one, and we have some rehab work to do. My wife and I have had I think this is home number four or five in our lifetime, uh, and we have never moved into a house that hasn't needed significant work. Uh, that's just, I don't know why we do that, but we just choose to do that every time. Uh, and so as we do that, we have to go to a rental place in between, and, and then my wife decided to break her leg the other day. 
uh, and that was just very unkind of her to do that. Uh, and so, see, she has a broken ankle, and so she's uh, going around on her scooter, uh, and uh, God has just seen fit uh, to complicate our lives in a number of different ways. We're coming to the end of our semester. Uh, students are saying, you know, you don't know complication, Dr. Kowser. You are my complication. But... But the issue here is that, uh, you know, there's, there's things that I need to do. Uh, there's responsibilities that I feel as a pastor for the lives of people around me. Uh, there's all these kind of things going on. And once you get to a while that, that I find myself getting chippy and irritable, right? I find myself uh, getting very, very myopically kind of self-obsessed, thinking about my own issues, my own problems, and getting irritated with other people that have problems, right? I have problems. You don't have problems. Right? And I don't know if you've ever felt like that before, if you've ever got in that kind of moment where uh, you get so self-focused and obsessed and your world kind of shrinks to the kind of difficulties that you're facing, um, that you start to even view people in your life as means to fix the problems in your life. You really don't care about them, but you want them to function in ways to make life easier for you. And here, uh, I want to talk about uh, a world that was in utter chaos with no rulers who had the best in mind for their subjects. And for a young, young woman whose life was taken into utter chaos by God's favor. And that God wanted them, the people of God, in the face of the government that they were under. And this young girl, in the face of the chaotic circumstances of her life, to know his peace. So there's some lessons for us, and so I want to look at those with you. Right? One, this first one here about God's at work in the big picture. Now, Augustus, right, Caesar Augustus, Augustus means exalted one, right? So as the dictator of this massive empire. What we're going to find in this story is that Augustus unwittingly furthers God's saving purposes. He unwittingly furthers them. And I have to admit to you, I'm, I'm my, somebody asked me the other day, one of my hobbies is I pay attention to the political arena. Uh, and I do that because one of the things I often like to think about is what does it mean to be Christian in America? And what does it mean for me to interact with the things that are going on? And, and there are a lot of really sad, chaotic things going on. Uh, when we have people in authority and in power uh, who are telling people, uh, that you can't look at your own body and get any indicators of your own identity. That's very troubling. Um, when my girls were growing up, it was a big deal. I think it may have even been uh, my mom or the grandparents who bought them American Girl dolls. Anybody know American Girl dolls, right? Same here, right? Those kinds of things. Well, American Girl just came out just this past week, a very apropos pun. Uh, came out this week and, and wanted to suggest to all little girls that there's many different ways to be girls. And so maybe you're a boy and you're a girl. Or maybe you're a girl and not a girl. And I just think that is so unabashedly evil. Evil. To undermine the identity of these young children at a very vulnerable age. And instead of taking the responsibility we have, uh, to help them understand who they are in the face of all the normal challenges that they're going to have. Instead, we, we unmoor them from the foundations that they have and send them adrift, uh, largely so that adults can be affirmed in their own proclivities. I just think it's heinous. So we're just in a place here, when you look at it, you're saying, is, is, where is God? You know, God, where are you in this moment? What's happening on? We've got... We've got uh, We've got little children who are, are being emasculated and changed for the whole of their lives before they even understand what it means to be a girl or a boy. Those are kind of, God, how can, how can this be? Where are you in this moment? What's happening? All right, well, here we are in the, in the first century world, and Augustus is on the throne. This is an, a dictator who literally has power of life and death over everyone. Right, it's hard for us to imagine in the, in the ancient Greek, uh, uh, Greco-Roman world, the dictator could do anyone. Uh, anything that he wanted. If you wanted to read uh, the kind of things that happened, you could pick up Suetonius' Lives of the Caesars. Uh, I recommend that you only do that as an adult because it's R-rated reading, if you will. And as you read about them, they did anything, right? The old statement, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts 
Absolutely, right? And so what you see is just absolute debauchery, absolute craziness, murder, uh, genocide, right? Uh, patricide, matricide, anything kind of side you can get in there, right? Anybody that you could possibly kill if they got in your way, uh, that would happen. Uh, and with little or no repercussions in terms of what would happen to the person who's behind it. Well, here, here's Augustus, and he's got a vassal king, King Herod, right? You know this King Herod. He's the one that's infamous because he tries to kill all the little babies in Bethlehem when he finds out that a possible pretender to the throne has been born. And so Augustus, right, he, what is he doing? Augustus is, he's uh, wanting to count all of his people so he can make sure that he's getting maximum income tax return. Right? He, wants to, he wants to pad his coffers. He wants to exert, exert his authority over the world. Right? So I'm going to count all the people, and I can. And if you think about this, right? think of a decree going from, from uh, uh, Washington, D.C. today. I command everybody at a certain time of the year to go back to the, the town in which you were born. Right? And you need to go back there and register Okay, so you need to get back there, right? Uh, it'd be, uh, now, at least maybe we could get in our car and drive back, or uh, some of us, we'd have to get a plane, right, to get back. Uh, but here, you're talking about people who are traveling over land, people who have to come from far-flung areas of the empire, right, by, by donkey and, and foot and all those kind of things like that. And just like that, he can tell everybody, by force of law, you've got to go back to your hometown, Right? I don't care what, what your dis situation is. I don't care what's going on. You need to go back and register uh, by force of law. And so here he's, he's commanding everyone. And on his level, right, he intends it to be a demonstration of his power, to get more information about how much money he's owed by everybody and to increase the coffers. So he thinks he's doing that. And all the while, unwittingly and unwillingly, he's accomplishing God's purposes. All the time. Right? So what do we know from the book of Micah, right? Micah is a little bit, uh, you know, earlier than the story of Luke, right? Hundreds of years earlier. Here's what Micah said in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. As for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, seemingly insignificant among the clans of Judah, from you a king will emerge who will rule over Israel on my behalf, one whose origins are in the distant past. So God had already determined a long time ago that Jesus was going to get to Bethlehem. He was going to be born in Bethlehem within one of the towns of David. And so here's Augustus exercising his authority, thinking that, right, he's accomplishing his own will, when in reality God on a much deeper level is accomplishing his will. So it reminds me, here's a, a famous proverb. Some of you will, re will recall this one, Proverbs 20, 24. The steps of a person are ordained by the Lord, so how can anyone understand his own way? Now, I say that to us, right? On, on the one hand, if God truly is sovereign, if God is providentially at work in the world, then we need to trust the Lord that he's at work on levels that's far beyond our ability to apprehend, right? We're going to be reading the book of Romans here in this beginning of the new year, and we're going to come to chapter 11 where Paul has, has contemplated the sovereignty of God and his purposes as he works them out. And he winds up at the end where you have to wind up after you contemplate God's greatness and his sovereignty and his plan. And he says, you know, God, your ways are inscrutable, <laughs> right? They're past finding out. Who's ever given you advice? Well, no one. Who's ever put you in your debt? No one, right? Because from you and through you and to you are all things. But it's amazing, right, when we get into our own difficulties, how we forget. We, we automatically think, well, you know, God, are you there? Right? This is what you read in the Psalms. When things are going crazy, somebody says, God doesn't even see. It's like he doesn't even pay attention to me anymore. God, have you fallen asleep? Right? Did my uh, guardian angel go on vacation? Right? What happened? Right? Where, where are you? It's like God somehow took his hand off the wheel, right? Or you took your hand off the wheel and God didn't take the wheel, right? Whatever that is. So all those kind of things, we, we, in our smallness, we think that because things are difficult in our life, that somehow God is not in control of what's going on, right? Well, Mary and Joseph were going through extremely difficult moments, and God was in control. Now, we want to be clear, right, that God does not do evil, okay? We want to be very clear about that. What what Scripture wants to say very much is, is that when God is at work and things are difficult, we, we understand by Scripture that either God 
is acting to avert a greater evil or he's acting to promote a greater good. But God himself, right, in him is light. There is no darkness at all, 1 John chapter 1. James chapter 1, God is good and every good gift comes down from him. And there's nothing in him that can be tempted by evil and he does not tempt anyone to do evil. So when we experience evil, it's because we've given rein to the evil in our hearts or we're experiencing the evil of other people. But God's always working through the events of the world to accomplish his good purposes, right? Uh, We need to learn the lesson, of course, that Joseph learned, the famous lesson from Genesis 50, right? Remember this statement when he's standing there looking at his brothers? What did his brothers do? They sold him into slavery. They abandoned him. They turned their back on him. And now here he is in a position of power, and he could use that power to get every bit of of skin back, right? To punish them completely, to humiliate them, right? And there he is, and he says, you intended this for what? For evil, but God intended it for good, right? And you may be facing that from someone in your life. We may be facing that from the country in which we're in, but God is busy working through the ashes of people's sinful choices to bring about good things in us and through us and we need to trust him to do that. It's not a time to become henny penny, right, and run around and say the sky is falling. It's not time to go get in a fetal position in our closet somewhere and saying America's gone to hell in a handbasket. It's not the time to give up on our families or give up on our spouses or give up on our kids or give up on the, the circumstances at our jobs. God, if God's big enough to move Augustus, he's big enough to take care of you, right? Is that not true? He's big enough right, to be at work in you. Now, we have to say, right, with this, Mary's not going to see, and we're talking about this, Mary's not going to see some of these good purposes throughout the whole of her life, and we'll come to that, right? So second, so God's at work on the big big picture, but he's also at work in the details, right? This is one of the things here is that that God's not, right, this is the, the, one of the conceptions uh, about God that sometimes people don't articulate as a philosophy, but they kind of live that way, is a kind of a deistic perspective on God. Now, now deism is the kind of idea that God is this, this big watchmaker. And he creates this watch, this universe, and then he puts certain laws in place, and then he lets it go, and then it just runs, right? Sort of like you got a, a wind-up toy, you wind it up, and then it runs, and then the person who's there with the toy doesn't do anything in the process. It just runs until it, it winds down. Right? Well, that's as if God is, is he's transcendent is the, is the kind of a theological term. He stands over and outside the world, but he's not imminent. He's not engaged in the world. Well, that's not true in Scripture, that God is not only the one who gave birth to everything, he created everything, but he also manages everything. He sustains everything. And matter of fact, he's involved in the lives of the people on the globe and individually, right? This is the thing that's astounding. Right? This is what blows our minds in the terms that God could be uh, right, the sustaining the world at large and at the same time care about you and your stuff, care about your life, care about your soul, care about your family, right? care about your addictions, care about your fears, care about your, your reversals and all those types of things. God, right, is he involved on that level or does he care? Does he see? Right? Is it too petty to bring up to him? Right? And this is where we often have to confront ideas of that, that arise in our heads because of dysfunctional people in our lives. Right? And all of us are some of those dysfunctional people in other people's lives. Right? And what I mean by that is, is that you know, we've got people in our lives who, who have told us to shut up when we've brought our problems to them, and we've inferred from that that that's the way God greets us when we come to that. So your dad or your mom or somebody that you entrusted, you went to them with a problem and they said, I ain't got time for you, right? I got bronchitis, right? I haven't got time for you. So just shut up, right? Do your own stuff. I don't have time for that. So I don't want to talk with you about that. I'm, you, you know, shut up, right? Those kind of things. And we got the idea that I just had to suck it up and talk to myself and deal with it. And then these weren't appropriate to bring to a person in authority. This wasn't appropriate to talk out loud. This wasn't something that I actually could talk to God about because it's just me being silly. And so here, what you want to see here is that God is at work in the details, 
to comfort and give direction to Mary. Okay, so two things about Mary. He was helping Mary know that unwelcome change in plans are all a part of the big plan. Okay, unwelcome change in plans are all a part of the big plan. I just, I just jotted this to myself today. She had come to Bethlehem because she had to, away from the home <clears throat> that she had prepared to receive her baby son. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we've had four girls in our family. My wife has prepared for every one of them to arrive. And I'm very thankful that she prepared, uh, that we were not surprised by any babies that came, uh, nor that uh, that she was not prepared to be a mom when they came. Uh, the one that she fretted over was Francesca, our number two. Uh, we were in the process of moving from Scotland, and Francesca refused to come on time. We've, we've, we've uh, been after her her whole life about that. Uh, so she just uh, ag aggravated our lives because we had plane tickets, and we were getting ready to leave Scotland, and I think it was three weeks beforehand. Is that right, honey? Three weeks? Uh, three weeks beforehand, Francesca finally decided to show up, Right? Uh, we were getting a little tense about those. And by that time, we had sold all of our furniture. We were about ready to leave. And so her nursery was a drawer from a bureau, right? So, and that, that offended my wife's, uh, you know, motherly sensibilities and aesthetic sensibilities. She was the one who had no nursery to greet her. And I'm sure that's psychologically harmed her her whole life. But those, those are the kinds of things, right? That, that, that you, so mothers, right? Mothers do. And you think about it, they they prepare for babies, Right, that prepare for babies. And there's no reason to think that Mary, right, we know she had a conversation with Elizabeth about this baby. Right? She had a conversation with her about that. She'd prepared for that. Here she was, a new mother, faced with a difficult journey to a strange place. Right? That's what every mother would love. Just about ready to give the birth and, and your husband walks in and says, Honey, we're moving to a place you've never been before. And I'm sure she'd be really pumped about that. Oh great, honey, that's great. I'm ready for an adventure, right? And above all that, she was carrying a special son with little to no idea about what that mean, might mean for her as a mother and for him as a child, right? I mean, it's not like the, the normal birth. So she got here and you're going you're to give birth to the son of God, right? This is a special son and you're going to give birth without an involvement of a man, okay? And Mary, right, she's She's presented by Luke as, as really the ideal disciple. Mary, right, she, she can't get it. She doesn't know what's going to happen, but she knows the God who told her it's going to happen. And so she says, Lord, just okay, let it be to me according to your word. I trust you. I trust you. I don't understand anything about what's going on, but, but I trust you, so I, let it be. Right, let it be. And so here's, here's Mary and so all these questions, I think, how do you care for and raise the son of the highest one, right? I'm sure there's no manuals for raising the son of God, right? 101, right? Uh, raising children God's way. There you go. Or, but this one would be raising God, right? That's that one. All right. Or, right, what would be fitting preparations to make? What would be required of her? What would he be like? Right? Is God with me in this? What do I do? The point of this story seems to be, and I think this is a very important point, the point of this story seems to be the comfort that is brought to Mary by the angelic announcement to the shepherds in their subsequent visit. What is the announcement that, the, that, that comes to her? It says, the announcement causes the shepherds and the people they tell to marvel, but it is Mary who holds them in her memory, constantly mulling over them. So when they come, what did the angel tell, right, the shepherds, okay? They not only told the shepherds that there was going to be a baby born, right? So look here, when the angels, it says here, uh, verse 12, there will be a sign to you, you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Now, she didn't know that, Mary, before she got to Bethlehem. And she got to Bethlehem, and she's got to have a baby, and so she carries for it the best she can. She can't find any place to stay, and where does she have to stay? She has to stay in a place where they keep animals. Do you think she, maybe she had some anxiety about the fact that I've got the Son of God in a, in a feeding trough? Right? Well, what, what does the angels tell them? Is that when they show up, they tell Mary that God intended all along for the baby to be wrapped in these clothes and laying in a manger. You're doing okay, Mary. 
Mary, you're doing okay. This is exactly what I intended, right, in terms of that. Now, the second one, right, God provides just-in-time directions for those he favors. Okay? He provides just-in-time directions. So, right, he wants him to be in a city. They want him to be in a city. She, want, she has to be in a city to prepare for the arrival. And so when, when, when Mary gets there, She's thinking about the issue here of, of the way he's being treated and taken care of. And not only do the, do, the, do the shepherds tell her that she's in the right place, but they tell her that the way she's caring for the baby, caring for the baby is the way that God had already set up. And I, I think that, that God, right, uh, the manger, the place that seemed so wrong for her baby, for God's son, was the very sign that the angels had given to the shepherds. Not just that you're going to have a baby, but he's going to be in a manger. Right? So this idea here is he gives her right what she needs to know, when she needs to know it, and he confirms and comforts her in the process of serving him while he's on this journey. Right? And this is one of those things, can we trust God if we obey him by faith to what he calls us to do? That he will meet us on that journey right? to sustain us, to guide us right? as we do it. And for Mary... Right? She stepped out by faith on the most crazy, bold journey that you could ever imagine. Now, let me give you some points for reflection right as we come to the end here. Okay, and this is where I want, you want to fill in the blanks. So if you're a blank filler in her, this is where you want to fill in the blanks. Okay? And if you missed any of the important points I was trying to get across or I didn't do it well to begin with, you'll get them here. All right? So let me give you the first one. God knows what he's doing. Right, that's the first one. He knows what he's doing. He's been planning this for a long time. <laughs> right? Do you really believe that God knows what he's doing in your life? What he's doing in your marriage? What he's doing, even in the face maybe of chronic illness? In the face of uh, unexpected loss? Do you really believe that God knows what he's doing? God, do you know what you're doing here? Right? Mary certainly would have been justified. God, do you know who I am? Do you know what this is going to entail? God, do you know what you're doing? And the Christmas story says, God, God knows what he's doing. Right? We can trust him. Right? We may not know what he's doing, but we do know the one who knows why. We know him. Okay, two. What God is doing in all our lives and in history centers on the baby in the manger. What God is doing in all our lives and in history centers on the baby in the manger. The baby through whom all the Old Testament promises and the promises to David in particular will be fulfilled for Israel and the world. Right? So what God is doing in all our lives and in history centers on the baby in the manger. Right? This is another call for us right at Christmas time to say that Jesus really should be the center of our reflections. Right? Jesus' will, Jesus' character, Jesus' purposes, right? those should be the focus right, of our celebrations, of our delight, right? of the way we live out our lives. And I would say this too is that of all the things that we should be thinking about of the people in our lives, because one of the things that happens right at holidays is family and the people that you love right, come into view in a particular way, right? Sometimes it's a sadness that you miss somebody who wouldn't have normally been there. But others, it just brings in the, the, the fact that family, for good or ill, is so central to life. And one of the things is, what are we thinking about as the primary concern when I think about my mom or my dad or my sister or my brother or my aunt or my uncle are we thinking about them and Jesus as the primary concern? Are we thinking about where they are with Jesus? About how they think of Jesus? About whether they know Jesus or not? Is that our primary concern at Christmas? Are we more concerned about giving them Jesus than we are about getting anything from them? Right? So Jesus is the center, right, of God's whole story. And he should be the center of our lives. Third, God is big enough to accomplish what he has set out to do. 
God is big enough to accomplish what he set out to do. I don't doubt God, Joy said in her, her testimony, sweet testimony, Joy. Joy, you made me cry today. So a testimony, right? God is big enough that once he set his mercy on Joy, he's going to take her to the goal for which he saved her. And either heaven or hell, life or death, things present or things to come, angels, powers, spirits, future can take joy out of his hand. He's big enough to save her and to keep her close to him, right? God's big enough to take the craziest, uh, most rebellious, hateful, walking the other direction person and turn them 180 degrees. He's big enough for that, right? Right? God's big enough to do those kinds of things. And do we have a God that we pray to that's big enough to do that? God's big enough to sustain you to love somebody who hates you. God's big enough to let you pour out your life on somebody who takes it for granted. God's big enough for you to say no to the things that darken your mind and own your soul. God's big enough, right? God's big enough to do that, right? Number four. He favors human agents. He favored human agents with important roles in his redemptive drama, right? You never see anything happen, right, in Scripture without God working through somebody. Somebody becomes his agent to do something, okay? God just doesn't always, he doesn't show up from heaven, right, and say, okay, you be mine, do that. So God always is working through people to do that. And so here's Mary, right, the most unlikely of of situations, right? And so God says, Mary, you're going to be my agent through whom I'm going to bring redemption to the world, right? And as far as the world scene is is concerned, nobody knew anything about Mary. Nobody cared anything about Mary. And literally in her time, if we didn't have the Gospels telling us about the story, nobody within, you know, 50 yards of Mary knew anything about her. And if they did know something about her, they thought she was somebody who got illegitimately pregnant, They thought, Jesus, as a matter of fact, you're going to find that if you read through the Gospel of John, you get to John chapter 8 and different things. When the Jewish leaders came up to Jesus, they said, you're just a bastard child. You're just a child of fornication, of illegitimate activity. That's what they threw at Jesus all the time. And of course, if they threw that at Jesus, who else were they throwing that at? Mary. Okay? So God uses human for important roles. And I want to say this too, is that I don't know what God is doing through your life, but you're, you're, you're God's kingdom foothold in every life that he has you in touch with. You're his voice, you're his hands, right? You're the voice of prayer. You're the voice, you're the one who's weeping and concerned. You're the person, right, in, in your mom's life, dad's life, brother's life, sister's life, friend's life, colleague's life, right? You're, you're the, you're the uh, foothold for the kingdom of God and his rule and his blessing there. And I don't know what, what your words are going to have impact on. I don't know what your acts are going to do, but God always works through people. And as I've said to you before, I, by God's grace, And I know that's not always true, but by God's grace, I don't want my life to be an obstacle that people have to crawl over to get to Jesus. Right? I want to help them get there. So he favors him. And then fifthly, these roles will demand losing yourself. These roles will demand losing yourself, though that may be something different for each of us. Right? Now, I'm saying losing yourself in the same thing that Jesus would say, right, if you're going to come follow me, you've got to deny yourself, right? But, the, the, but it's not, that's not the end of it, right, that the life is a life of self-denial. No, the life is an exchange. You deny yourself so that you can find yourself, right? And so it's a trust, a deep trust in God that what he's asking you to do to deny, right, your comfort Because, you know, to step out and represent him or to say no to something when you're being pushed by your peer group to go in a different direction, you've got to stand over against your cup front and deny that, right? Or to embrace awkwardness or even sometimes to embrace rejection or to embrace the fact that, that other people's needs become the primary need and that you're not asking at the end of the day every day that I get treated in the way that I deserve. You're asking, Lord, did I serve you in the way that you called me to? You get this wonderful self-forgetfulness that allows you 
right? To love on the people in your life. Listen, I think about this with Mary. For Mary, it meant letting go of her vision of being a wife and a mother. Letting go of her reputation. Letting go of her plans for Jesus' birth. Letting go of her friends and family. Letting go over the control of her life. Right? If that doesn't give you the heebie-jeebies, you're not thinking seriously about it. Right? Because you have to have a deep trust in God to say, God, God says go this way. And you say, God, I trust you. And you know, right, this is one of the things about sometimes the Christians, I think, get so wrong. They talk about open doors. You know, how do I know that this is God's will? Because he's opened a door. Well, what do you mean he's opened the door? Well, I'm not having any opposition and everything is going great. Okay, I just think that's exactly the wrong way to think about an open door. Right? If you follow Paul and he's praying for open doors, he gets an open door to go to Macedonia and, every, and just chaos breaks out. He's persecuted everywhere he goes. And if he had that philosophy of, of open doors, you'd be thinking, well, maybe God didn't open the door to Macedonia after all. Right? No, to open the doors, God gives you a venue to serve him. Right? But if you're going to be faithful to him, we already know this from Jesus, the more you look like Jesus and talk like Jesus and represent Jesus' passions and priorities, what's going to happen? You're going to get treated like Jesus. Right? So the idea here is we've got to let go. And some of the times right at Christmas, everybody's telling you what you need to get a hold of, <laughs> what you need to have. And a lot of that we need to let it go. That vision of life, that vision of happiness, that vision of fulfillment. No, 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 that's not going to fulfill me. No, I, I don't need that. I don't need the latest version of this that's I'm only going to be told next year that I'm going to need the latest version this next year. Right? I, I, need, I need to have Jesus ruling and reigning in my soul. All right, next one, six. He provides enough help. He provides enough help, guidance, and comfort to sustain and direct them in their roles. Right? He provides enough to sustain and direct us. Okay? One of the things, I'm going to come back to joy again here today. One of the things that God does provide is he provides us for each other. Now, when he says we, when he provides, it doesn't mean that, that you walking as a lone ranger for Jesus, that God promises. No, no, no. He, he promises you that he's given you the resources and his resources are his word. You have his ear through prayer. You have his people. And, right, it's like the old joke of the, of the uh, uh, guy who's complaining that, uh, you know, he was praying to God and God didn't help him. Well, uh, you know, he was praying, he was on a, on a raft in the middle of the river and he was going down the river and he prayed and, and a guy showed up in a helicopter and said, you know, I'll help you get out. And he said, no, no, I asked God to help me, I'm waiting on him to help me. Okay. God said, I sent the guy in the helicopter. And then a the guy goes past in a, in a boat. And he says, no, no, I'm waiting on God. And God says, I sent the guy with a boat. And so often God's hands are the people in this room. Their prayers are upholding you today. They're upholding you. They're asking for God's resources for you to keep Jesus at the center of your life, not to forget your identity, to hold on to the things that matter, to give God your, your trust and your obedience and, and to renew hope in you in the midst of a very difficult moment maybe. And then seven, those whom he favors, those who respond to his grace with faith in Christ's Savior, find peace. Peace is way more than just an absence of conflict. Matter of fact, biblical peace that you enjoy in this moment is not going to be free from conflict. This is, a, this is a, a, a change of heart and life that, that deep within you, the most important things are settled. That gives you a sense of contentedness and confidence to face the chaos and craziness of life. Scripturally, you know what the biggest fear is? It's the wrath of God over against us. As Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? But the flip side of that is, if God isn't for you, it doesn't make any difference who's on your side. 
I don't care how many people like you. I don't care how much adulation you get. I don't care how, many, how much people are willing to pay you to, so that they can look at your pictures and follow you or listen to the quips that you make. I don't care how much you have, how much applause you have. If you're not righted with a God who's made you, there's no grounds for genuine peace and contentedness in your soul. You can distract yourself, but that's the resource. So peace, right, scripturally, is this holistic flourishing of people because it writes them with the God who made them. It brings them into the true identity for which they've been made. It reorders their vision of themselves and of other people. It just writes things. And it enables you to face life with a confidence that the God who saved you can get you to the goal that he saved you for, that he knows you, that he loves you, and you have a sense that comes from his restoration of your identity and purpose that comes through Christ. He grants peace. Now you think about this. One of our favorite Christmas prophecies in Isaiah 7, 14 is he's going to be the prince of peace. When he sees his disciples after the resurrection, he says, peace be to you. I like this one phrase by one author. I want to live into it. He says here, through Christ's saving work, we've been gifted with the state of being which lacks nothing. Do you believe that? That you have all of God's riches in Christ, you don't lack anything. What we all need, desperately need, is a deeper appreciation of what we already have that lacks nothing and has no fear of being troubled. I like this phrase. It is euphoria with security. (laughs) Euphoria with security. We have been set on the way of God, the path of peace, even as we live in anticipation of the writing of all things. Right? When we get to the end of the book of Romans, he's going to say this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. So let me end here. How do you need to be encouraged today? Pick out one of those. Is your God too small? Are the problems too big? Can you trust him? I want to end here. and I'm going to call an audible here. David who's sitting out here. He's aware of that. But um, I just want to pray here at the end. But if you don't know Jesus... Right, there's a famous little quip. You'll see it on, on, on T-shirts, and most of the time I don't like these. Right? But, but this one really is, is true. You know, N-O, no Jesus. N-O, no peace. K-N-O, no Jesus. K-N-O, no peace. And that's true. The peace that God wants to give you the sense that things are righted between you and God, that transforms everything, is available to you at any moment. But it's a dramatic thing. It's where you turn to Christ and say, I can't bring peace to my own soul. I don't trust any other voices to tell me where peace is. And so I ask you, Jesus, to do for me what I cannot do for myself. Would you bring peace to my life? God, would you save me and do for me what I can't do for myself? And Jesus said, I will. I will come and establish my rule in your heart, and I am the prince of peace. Right? I don't know if you know Jesus today, but I'd love to help you get to know him. If you're a follower of Jesus today, right, this isn't to guilt us. This isn't to to hammer us. This is just simply say, don't forget where peace lies in the middle of the chaotic moments where we are. You can't afford to face a day without talking to the Prince of Peace. You can't afford to face a day without listening to him about what really matters. And above all, when our culture is crazy and screaming at each other all the time, you need to go to Jesus so that you can get some peace. Would you stand with me and we'll pray and be dismissed together. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your kindnesses to us. 
Lord, it's amazing to see your hand, Lord, working through history, through time, to orchestrate events right, right down to the very details. Lord, you determined the place, the time. You worked uh, through the hearts of kings, Lord, because they're as uh, rivers in your hand and you turn them where you desire. And Lord, you worked through a, a little girl, a young woman. You favored her with being the one through whom the Savior of the world would be born. And Lord, you, you, you directed her, you blessed her, you comforted her. You sustained her. And Lord, I pray for us as your followers. Lord, today, would we trust you? Lord, I know some of my brothers and sisters here are facing just really hard times, facing fearful moments. Lord, I pray that, that they would turn to you and find you, uh, Lord, as the one who grants the peace that passes understanding that only your followers can know. And Lord, I pray, Lord, if there's some among us who, does not, who do not know you, Lord, I pray, Lord, would you draw their hearts to you? Lord, and would you use us, Lord, through the course of our celebrations and our lives, Lord, to be people of peace uh, who live uh, in the joy of knowing Christ and who proclaim it and offer it. Lord, may we be peacemakers. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.